I grew up in what we call a colored community. Okay. Um, in Cape Town, South Africa, I know that's quite derogatory in, yes. in many countries, but in South Africa, it is the description to our mixed race population. Yes. Um, it's a community that was tightly knit, but didn't have many economic prospects. Uh, and so my late father, who I uh, love and revered, okay. uh, was a political activist. And he was a political prisoner and then served for many years house arrest after that. When he was okay. done serving, okay. um, he didn't receive any favors or opportunities, even on a meritocracy basis. Uh, so he had to work an ordinary, honest job. Okay. Um, but then was unfortunately retenched um, or furlonged from his, from his job at about 50 years old. Uh, he died at 60. 66, but he got onto a taxi every morning, a minibus at four o'clock to go and either find work or to work for minimum wage. So he was a very intelligent, highly principled um, man uh, and incredibly hardworking. Meanwhile, I got married uh, quite young. Okay. And so my wife and I, uh, because we didn't have a credit record, we couldn't lease uh, a space of our own to live in. So we lived in one room in somebody yes. else's property. Okay. Um, and we did everything in that room. Uh, she then suggested that we get access or apply for a store credit, which is like clothing clothing credit. It's a big thing in South Africa. Okay. And so we did that. I was surprised that we got it. But that allowed us to build a credit record. Then eventually we could lease a place of our own. And then right. years later, buy our first property together. So why am I sharing this with you? Well, okay. this the, the one is that in my father's case, I often wonder what life would have been like for him had he had access to uh, a housing finance, for example, or a mortgage, right? What would happen if he had insurance against being furlonged? Um, and, and, and so it shows you how, in my instance, I was yes. incredibly fortunate, but yeah. the fundamental change that financial services and banking can bring about when delivered appropriately. Yes. But on the flip side of that coin, it also demonstrates the uh, incredible damage that financial services and banking can bring about if delivered inappropriately. So that's the one reason. The second reason I'm sharing this with you is because it taught me the first big lesson in business. Okay. And that is that the confluence of business and real deep meaning for an entrepreneur doesn't necessarily come up front. It's a windy journey uh, to get that place. And I think I've been very blessed that I found it along the way, even though I got into digital banking much later on. Okay, okay. So what inspired you to start Time Banks? And what the vision behind that? We, yeah, we are so the, look. Yes. So, yes, so, yes. so, so the, the best way I can describe this is that uh, what we created with time is a multi country digital banking business. Okay. Where we've shaped a business model that can allow us to bring banking to, to most segments of society at a fundamentally lower cost point. So, okay. if we look at the, the key barriers to banking. Uh, certainly in emerging markets globally, it's really about it's really about barriers to access. So the first barrier to access is physical access, right? The second barrier to access is uh, affordability mm. or financial access, and the third barrier is about um, a, it's a trust barrier. So we lower these barriers. For example. Um, We've got a model where we're fully digital, right? In okay. the countries that we operate in, but where we, we augment digital with physical. So we integrate into retail environments where a okay. customer can walk into a physical retailer. She mm -hmm. can she can go up to one of our kiosk technologies, which looks like a self-service terminal in an airport. She puts down her fingerprints and without providing a stitch of paperwork, in the space of three to five minutes, she walks away with a transactional bank account, a savings bank account, a debit card that comes out of this kiosk with a name personalized on it, and everything is 
immediately live, ready to transact. You can get money in and out like you do with any bank. And in addition to that, you can get money in and out at retail till points. So, so that's a way in which we lower physical access. But okay. because we able to use modern technology and data, mm-hmm. we able to deliver that at a at a much lower price point, right? So effectively, what I've described now is that we've mimicked the core functionality of an old bank branch, but with a much better customer experience at a much lower price point. And okay. that benefit we can pass on to the customer so we lower the barrier to financial access. And then we've built trust by being a lot more transparent using modern technology, um, by having simple pricing structures uh, and so on, so that we don't confuse our customers uh, with a plethora of vague information. So it's really those our ability to lower those access in inter-emerging markets to bring about fundamental change um, to, to the lives of people we serve. Or whether you are banked customer, an unbanked customer, an underbanked customer, or a heavily served customer, doesn't matter. That operating model um, serves all of those customers at, with a much better experience than the old banks can. And that's really why time was created. Okay, okay. Alors, I saw your interview yesterday, and you said you are building a new challenge bank system. What does it mean? Yeah, I think, you know, it's certainly in a country like South Africa, yes, I would describe the banking sector as an oligopoly. I think for, for far too long, too few players have had um, a grip on the whole market. And that yes. creates a malaise and a complacency where the customer is no longer the center of the universe. <laughs> okay. Um, And, and it's actually the customer that suffers, right? The customer starts, ends up paying more and more for banking services. The customer gets um, uh, shut out more and more uh, from products such as loans because these old banks are looking for the wrong signals from customers because they have old technology. Okay. Uh, and, it's the, and it's the customer who suffers from, 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 uh, from a lack of access. So... So when I say we are building a, a challenger system to banks is that we've created and shaped a business model that from day one allows us to take on the old banks head on with a similar scale, right? Okay. Um, but with an absolutely fundamentally structurally different custom experience and price point. And that's exactly what we've done in our first market, which is Time Bank in South Africa, um, where we nearly have... Uh, where we have 7 million customers now, having launched wow. the business only four years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing we've done with GoTime in the Philippines, which we launched six months ago, and where we have half a million customers. Okay, okay. So uh, how do you see the future of digital bank evolving in Africa? And what trend of technology do you think we have the most impact? Yeah, the, <laughs> this is a difficult question to answer, right? Because in a way, you have to gaze through a crystal ball. Um, look, the, the, if you look at the mega trends, right? So, so, so we can we can spend days talking about decentralized finance, embedded finance, uh, platformization, yes. open banking, and all of, of these things, right? Um, but at the end of the day, if you look at Africa as a continent, which I don't like to do because we are so nuanced, certainly sub-Saharan Africa, Okay. The the massive impediment is still mobile broadband coverage and mobile broadband usage. Um, and so the ability for ordinary Africans to access um, fast internet on their mobile devices is still a massive impediment because unless you breach that gap, right? We will remain a cash economy largely, or at best we will become an old bank branch uh, economy. Okay. So, so now the good news is even though hundreds of millions of customers are finding them, hundreds of millions of Africans are still finding themselves in that usage gap, the gap is closing, right? Okay. So, yes. so and I think it will get to a point where more and more Africans will be using things like social media platforms. The, mm-hmm. the, the levels of digital literacy will rise and that creates the opportunity for digital 
banking. But I don't think it will be straightforward digital banking. I think I think it will be digital banking, for example, with embedded finance. So if you look at the value chains in many of our African countries, um, links into supply chains um, with, with major suppliers, um, such as those playing in the FMCG space, I think there's massive opportunity there. But, you know, for me, it's less about trying to predict the future. You know, yes. there's the saying in ice hockey, you you slide to where the puck is going to be, right? And and yes. and so to me, it's less about predicting the future, but picking up the signals around developments in the market and and making sure that organizationally you move in the right right direction to take advantage of the opportunity. And I think the players that will win in Africa, yes, uh, where this is concerned, are those that know how to work with technology, yes, that know how to to work with with data in a very modern way and that have the organizational culture to be responsive uh, to the changes in the market, both the signals they get back from customers, small businesses, as as well as where technology is going. So I've got a slightly contrarian view on this. Okay, okay. Can you share any advice for aspiring entrepreneurs who want to start digital banks of yours? <laughs> Perhaps, 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 you know, you know, I, I certainly don't want to get into the obvious things, right? Which which is like around market fit and uh build what's relevant, you know, get funding and so on. I think those things everyone knows. I I might just offer some things more at the personal level. Okay. So so I think the first tip, if you like, is is make sure that your intent intent is virtuous and wholesome. So what do I mean by that? Make sure you want to start a business for the right reasons, that it's okay. not that it's not uh, influenced by your ego or your sense of self. And I tell you why this is important because um, building and running and scaling a new business irrespective of sector is incredibly tough. Um, and and you need to stay the course, and it's easier to stay the course if you have good intent. Because, for example, you don't want to surround yourself and ask advice from people that that will just tell you what you want to hear. So, so the first tip is 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 about intent. The second tip is about self consciousness or self awareness. Okay. And particularly, I mean that. Try and introspect and understand not only where you are good, but where you are not that good, right? Because every business, every inspiring yeah. entrepreneur needs three attributes, I believe. They need the, the entrepreneur archetype. This is the person who's visionary, who can put the pieces together, who can go and convince the market, who can raise funding and so on. Okay. The second archetype that the business needs, particularly in a startup phase, is a technician. Right? Engineer. This is the person that, yeah, yes. not necessarily the engineer, but it's the person who actually puts the thing together and understands the thing intimately at a technocratic level. And the third architect type that a, that a startup needs is a manager. This is the person who makes sure that everything is mm -hmm. controlled, that the downside is looked at, that people are organized, that there are no loose ends and so on. And often in my experience, Entrepreneurs hardly ever have all of those archetypes in them. So, so, so my second tip is about self awareness, understanding where which of those archetypes you best fit with, and then surrounding yourself with the people right? okay. in that that have the competency where perhaps you don't. 